which I think I'll be expelled from the internet for asking the question. Uh, it's very popular at the moment to uh, to extol the virtues of undoubtedly one of the fathers of modern music. I have a lot of respect uh, for Bach. It's just that I don't particularly like listening to his music. I think it's got to the stage now where this bandwagon of appreciation, which I don't want to denigrate, I just don't want to join in with, um, has got me to the point where I'm going to say, well, I'm pinning my colours to my mast and saying, I don't particularly like listening to this stuff. Is that okay? It's a, it's, a, it's such an interesting question. The reason I'm making this video is because I think there are certain situations in which it's difficult to justify saying that you don't like something, um, primarily if you've not actually listened to it. You know, I'm talking about specifically music here. I don't want to branch out into other forms of artwork, but the same principle applies everywhere. If you don't listen to a song, you can't say you dislike the song. If you haven't listened to enough of the body of work of a particular artist or genre, then you're not entitled to say you don't like that artist or genre because otherwise you're just coming from a point of ignorance and that's just dumb. The flip side of that is that if you get to the stage where you think, you know what, I've given this a reasonable effort now, it could be an hour, it could be 10 hours, 100,000, depending on the breadth of the, um, of the dismissal that you're making, I think you have to basically put your own kind of Wheaton's Law test to the principle, ask yourself, have I made enough effort to like this thing to entitle me to say that I don't like it. Now, that effort, you know, the, the word effort is in air quotes because it shouldn't be a chore. It should be something that you enjoy doing. We, we, we listen to music for pleasure. But sometimes something doesn't unveil its secrets instantly. You know, it, it can take a little bit of work. A wonderful analogy. We'll kind of do a couple of story time uh, things in this little uh, segment today. I want to tell you the story of how I got into David Bowie because for the longest time, I was in my mid-20s uh, when I first started to love David Bowie's music after having spent years just really not getting it. Now, I didn't know anybody who was a sufficiently big fan to kind of help me through those difficult times, but eventually I, did, uh, 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 I befriended a person at work who... Uh, was a huge David Bowie fan and I said to him right okay this is it this is your opportunity convince me convince me why I'm wrong I want to I want to learn what I'm missing and so he let me change his and I took it home and listened to it and it kind of didn't do the, the trick took it back to him and said yeah Andy Warhol's good but no not so much so then he lent me Ziggy Stardust and I took that home listened to it thought yeah title track's good but no no not still not and in desperation, his third attempt was to lend me a low, which I took home and it blew my mind. Absolutely unbelievable. I, I went back to work the following day and it said more like that. In fact, not only more like that, but where has this been all of my life? I'm kind of angry that I've not heard it sooner because I've wasted all these years not knowing that this incredible thing existed. It's now one of my all-time favourite albums. But more importantly, that was the in. You know, that was the, the opportunity for me to kind of branch out from 1977 and discover the likes of Heroes and Lodger and Station to Station and other albums that I grew to love. And I've now become a huge David Bowie fan and I love, well, changes, not so much. I never actually really cracked Ziggy Stardust, truth be told, but the vast majority of his work I do um, adore. So, so I know that it can be done. You can start from this perspective of, you know, I'm not really into this artist, song, band, genre, whatever it is. If you say, well, I'm going to try because other people love it. So I would like to appreciate that too. In the case of David Bowie, I, I succeeded and he's now one of my favourite musicians. I did a similar kind of thing with Bach. I listened to much of Brandenburg Concertos, the well-tempered clavier, the stuff that you're told to listen to. I've given it a decent bash, and yet it's still kind of slipping off. It might be that my understanding of counterpoint isn't sufficiently um, well-versed for me to appreciate all of the technical nuance. If that's the case, then it's definitely not for me, because I have a much more emotional response to music than that. 
it could be the sound that's turning me off. I don't particularly like the sound of the violin. I don't particularly like the sound of the harpsichord. They're instruments that can sound wonderful, absolutely sublime, but as a general matter of principle, they're not sonic things that happen in my ears that I have a, a natural or immediate uh, affinity to, and that's okay. That's absolutely fine. So I think I've passed the Wheaton's Law test as to whether or not I'm, I'm entitled to say that I don't particularly like Bach's music. I think I've listened to enough of it now. I'm not prepared to go to university to study him in order to learn how to like him. I'm just going to say, you know what? I've tried, but thanks. I'll move on. It's kind of funny, actually. Maybe I do have a prejudice against classical music as a concept because the majority of the classical music that I love I've come to through pop culture. I like a lot of the music of Mozart because of the film Amadeus. Uh, I love Madame Butterfly because of Fatal Attraction. Um, the Blue Danube, 2001. Probably the funniest illustration is Bolero, Ravel's Bolero, which is unbelievable. What a piece of music. Discovered that because it was the music behind an ice dance routine for a couple of um, British ice dancers in the 1980s. 1980, I think it was. Anyway, whenever it was, I heard this piece of music and it kind of blew me away and then subsequently went on to discover how incredible the thing itself was. Maybe if I'd not had those pop culture experiences, I wouldn't like the likes of Don Giovanni, for instance, which is a wonderful opera and I, I adore listening to it. But I have the images from the film Amadeus in my mind when I'm listening to it. And it definitely helped me overcome uh, that, let's call it a prejudice, shall we? And I don't think I've ever had that crutch when it comes to Bach's music, apart from Toccata and Fugue, which I don't know anybody who doesn't like Toccata and Fugue, but that's just one piece of music I would like to appreciate, you know, a much wider um, span. But I, I don't think it's going to happen. And so I'm kind of, I'm okay with that. It's fair enough. All I would say is if you can find it in your heart to not hate me for not liking Bark, then I would very much appreciate it. This prejudice that we have against people who decide after a, a respectful amount of effort to appreciate a thing, when they come back and say, this isn't for me, thanks, but no thanks. I've got no problem with that. If, if I lend an album to somebody and they listen to it twice and give it me back, I'm good with that. Twice is enough. Maybe if they'd listened to it three, four, five times, they would have grown to love it. But that is too much to ask of anybody. There's an awful lot of music out there. And the vast majority of the time, the first time I hear a piece of music, I know if I'm going to love it. More often than not, if I dislike it, I'm always going to dislike it. But I am aware that there are th those situations where I can change my mind. Let me give you one final um, little anecdote before we um, close up for the day. On that subject, uh, Sweet Jane by Velvet Underground is the perfect illustration uh, from my personal perspective of a song that I really disliked that I grew to love. I heard it on the radio. I was making Sunday dinner um, one afternoon and it was on um, it was on a radio show and the, the, the two people on the show were talking about the song after it played and described it as one of the best songs of all time. And they were really waxing rhapsodic about it. And I'd listened to it thinking, what on earth are you talking about? Did we just hear the same song? It annoyed me so much because again, Velvet Underground is one of those bands that's very highly respected, very highly regarded. And it annoyed me that I didn't like it. So I set myself a challenge of listening to it over the course of the next week. I probably listened to it 15 to 20 times over the course of a week. I read the Wikipedia entry on it. I read forums on the meanings behind the lyrics. And by the end of the week, I loved it. I, I, I did actually manage to crack the song. And it was principally through discovering what the lyrics were about. Fundamentally, it's a reference to a film, Days of Wine and Roses, with um, Jack Lemmon and I believe Mia Farrow. Anyway, it's a, a film from the 60s. And the, the, the lyrics are about this film. And if you don't know that, if you don't have that context, they make a lot less sense. Uh, and so once I discovered what the artistic kind of context behind the song was, I was then able to start appreciating it. So I actually approached that one from a lyrical perspective, which is a, a, a different in, but just as reasonable as the, the instrumental in that I got from David Bowie's Low. 
the fact was that once I'd found that that kind of finger hold in the cliff, I was able to surmount it. And listening to it over and over again, I, I actually genuinely grew to love the tune. And by the end of the week, I I adored it. And it's now in my playlists. It's it's a song that I enjoy and, li- and look forward to listening to. So it absolutely can be done. But by God, it took some work. You know, 10 listens, 10 listens in, I still wasn't, I wasn't there. I just wasn't getting it. So if you're prepared to put the effort in, eventually you will very often unlock this this key, but sometimes it's not going to happen. And both of those answers, both of those conclusions are, uh, they're okay in my book. And I don't think you should f- kind of feel ashamed or embarrassed for saying something like, you know, I don't like the Rolling Stones. That's another thing of mine. I'm trying so hard at the moment to learn to like the Rolling Stones. And it's bloody hard because... It's just not music that I'm not, I naturally um, gravitate towards. And so I'm trying to find individual pieces of music that I can kind of cling on to, to say, right, well, I'll start there and try to find other stuff of a similar style. I don't think you, you should ever uh, criticise somebody for saying, I've listened to this and I don't like it. I think that's absolutely fine. That's a million miles away from saying, I know I'm not going to like this, so I'm not going to listen to it. That's an entirely different situation. Anyway, a little story time over. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please hit the like button. I'll see you for the next one. Thanks a lot.